making noise measurements can be challenging and you might not get a second chance. Uh, it's kind of important to get it right the first time. It's expensive. This webinar, we're going to talk about some things to do and not to do that'll help ensure a good measurement. So yeah, so we're here at the metal shop. So we're part of the MTS uh, Systems Corporation. So while PCB specializes in kind of design and manufacture of a number of sensors, signal conditioning, um, and other instruments, uh, the metal shop we specialize in offering rental services, uh, one of which is a lot of the Larson Davis gear, and also making calibration systems, shakers, and structural test equipment, um, and then fuel calibration. So we're bringing this to you live here from our shiny new building here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And Larson Davis, like the modal shop, focuses on creating complete solutions that combine hardware and software that meet noise and vibration monitoring challenges um, in a variety of industries. Application ranges from environmental noise monitoring, um, that topic will be covered today, um, to others, which, you know, industrial hygiene, building acoustics, audiometer calibration. But a lot of what we're going to be focusing on today is in environmental noise monitoring. And it's kind of funny, you know, even the premise of today's webinar is um, noise measurements, you know, and pitfalls during them doesn't necessarily mean environmental. Just environmental is kind of the extreme that encompasses a lot of noise measuring uh, problems. So even if you're not doing environmental noise monitoring, a lot of what's going to be covered today will apply to your particular test as well. Graduated University of Cincinnati back in 2010. Here is nearly seven years at the shop. Here, uh, in a couple weeks actually. Um, so primarily working in rental and support our structural test products here at the Mobile Shop, so shakers and the like. Um, but I've been doing a lot of sound-based uh, support here with rental. So, I guess sound-wise, yeah, like quiet on the golf course, but bring on the race cars. But yeah, now I have a new New car repair coming my way, it sounds like. So, That's always fun. It sounds dislike. <laughs> uh, this is Bruce. I've been here about 21 years. Uh, I lead the systems for both rental and recalibration services teams. Um, I like quiet and loud music. And I just got back from vacation last night, so I dislike nothing. So, there. <laughs> So we're just going to start digging into the meat here because a, a lot of this has been presented and diced and sliced in different ways. Today, we almost are presenting what we hope might become something like a checklist that we can provide as a service to people. So we're going to guide you through almost like the entire life of a noise measurement uh, process and things that we find go wrong from time to time. You know, you can collect just starting out starting to plan for a noise monitoring event, you can collect dozens of different metrics that provide a lot of the data. It's really important to know what you need to collect. Um, is there a guideline or standard you're using? Are you comparing to something from the past? Um, where and how long? Are you measuring only during hours? Are you monitoring all day, all night, multiple weeks, months, years? And understanding parameters, that's really key. And sometimes it's uh, a re-education that we even need to do with experienced users if um, you haven't done a particular subset in a while. Uh, an example we give a lot here is L-Peak uh, versus the L-Max. Um, L-Peak is the highest instantaneous sound level with no time waiting. And the hot L-Max is the highest time weighted sound level uh, over a given period of time. And those are, if you're not doing sound metrics quite a bit, those sound very similar, and they're really not. LP is often used in impulsive or gunshot type measurements, and LMAX is often used in environmental noise monitoring, like construction or something. So just simple differences like that, you know, what frequency weighting are you using? Are you using day night or day evening night criteria, octave band or third octave? The parameters that you're measuring really inform all the choices that you're going to make downstream. So it's really important, especially if you're doing a new type of measurement that may be unfamiliar to you, um, to take a step back and make sure you're measuring the right stuff. 
and I one of my true dislikes now that I'm at work for a few hours uh, is people that just read presentations, all the words. So I'm going to here for a bit too, but I swear it'll be useful stuff. <laughs> The analyzer selection, and a lot of times here, we're going to be talking about analyzers, but really, it, most often what we're dealing with is a level meter. Even if you'd say a generic analyzer may be able to provide an LEQ, for example, is it really rated? Is it a class one or a class two? Does it have pattern approval? Has, does it go through a complete factory test for what needs to be done for an acoustic measurement? And be aware that you get what you pay for. It's it's tricky to kind of put that in uh, you know quantitative terms, but it's true. And if you viewing this and you're prone to seeing some pitfalls in a real life measurement, maybe you've seen this. Um, are there any standards that need to be met? Can it measure what you're hoping to measure? And be aware that some of the parameter names can kind of slightly differ over time. Um, and from manufacturer to manufacturer, it's goofy, but some manufacturers don't even uh, apply common terms to the measurements they take. Um, is alert and alarm notification required, you know, like text or emails? Um, can you remotely log into your meter? Um, and now's the time to start paying attention to that. If you need wind speed or temperature or barometer measurements, uh, can those be integrated into your acoustic measurement easily? And we'll spend a lot of time today on a lot of the common ones that you may think. Is there adequate memory, power, uh, environmental considerations that you can think of two or three, but sometimes uh, you get into the field and you, you realize, man, there are a lot more than I thought. And budget. This is, uh, you know, where rental comes into play as well, but really uh, making the most of your monitoring dollars what you have available for any project and also thinking about the non-specifics like what kind of access is really required you need constantly to check on the system or just occasionally on demand a daily transfer and one thing that seems a little boring um but it's it happens all the time it just happened to us two weeks ago again on a rental uh the microphone considerations. Think about like a free field when you're pointing at a source or an in a coke space, uh, in a coke space. Random microphones or for like diffuse like reverb rooms. Pressure when a mic is flush mounted. And think about the sensitivity. Can you really measure um, just because your sound meter may be able to measure down to 20 dB or below? doesn't mean that your microphone that you've coupled with it and your preamplifier can all perform that way as a system. So be aware of those parameters and how they affect your measurement. And mics are a great combination of robust when you use them properly and delicate and easily damaged when not. So know who handles your equipment when it's not being used. Um, you know, we don't put many pictures of mics in our presentations because they look kind of boring. They all look the same after a while. Under the hood, um, a drop, or um, if you take the grid cap off, for example, and di uh, damage the diaphragm, it could be a visible damage, it could be not visible. And some of the checks and balances that you do that we'll talk about calibration later may or may not be able to detect it easily. So pay attention to that storage and handling aspect. Um, and then also remember that a lot of modern sound meters um, offer some corrections. You may, corrections may be built into your meter so that one mic could be used for a variety of applications. And these digital filters maintain, you know, type designation as well for most cases. Um, talking about memory, you want to talk about? Yeah, so memory is kind of that, in, that invisible thing that you don't really think about until it's too late and well, potentially run out. So the numeric data the meter records typically, so your LEQ, your max, your min, or your, your octave band data, that is small in the size that you're, you're ultimately trying to collect. It doesn't take up a lot, a lot of memory, um, depending on the setup anyway. So if you're going to be collecting data at a higher rate, say less than 
a one second, uh, a one second averaging period, um, then that can serve that up. So while it's small, it's something you need to be prepared for and make sure that you have adequate memory for even just that basic numeric data. Um, then when you add in features with like the 831C where you can do sound recording capabilities, um, that adds another you know, layer of items to think about with your with your data capability. So the 831C can save these sound recordings in a full WAV file or in a compressed OGG file uh, as the particular file type. Um, so depending on exactly how you're saving, compressed or uncompressed, that can quickly add up from megabytes to gigabytes of data and you know, a couple of days period. Um, so that's where utilizing uh, items like just a little 32 gigabyte USB flash drive added to the meter to expand its memory capability um, by having the data saved and sent to that drive once a day, maybe even multiple times a day, um, if you're worried about maybe potential power loss for data integrity. Um, then you might also add in uh, capabilities of a cellular modem. So that way you can push data to the cloud and save it on the cloud to access anywhere. Um, essentially throughout your measurement, so you're, you're not worried about running out of memory if it has a longer term measurement that you're running with a system that has an AC power or a solar power, so you don't have to visit the field. So it's something that isn't thought of up front. Um, so that's where utilizing G4, taking, say, a sample of practice run of data in your office for a day to verify data you are collecting can be very valuable to make sure you have met what you need to complete your measurement in one shot. Re retesting is costly. And a lot of this presentation ends up being cyclical. We'll double back to this point, but verifying your actual measurements in the field can be really important um, for uh, that memory use. You could test it in the in the lab or in, in your office and still not get the same kind of uh, memory requirements that you may see in the field. So um, even pay attention, this is a great application for remote access to the meter where you can start to say, hey, I'm, I'm getting way more sound recordings than expected or something. My memory may have trouble over, you know, by day 40 or something, or day 10, you never know. And specific notes on the audio recording to kind of expand what Chad had said. Um, Sound recordings just identify the sounds, um, but really pay attention to how memory is affected. Um, the compressed files are great for text or email alerts. They minimize space and allow for identifications. But that uncompressed are perfect for further analysis. Um, the you know you can record continuously. Um, it's possible, but it, you have to ask yourself: Is it important what you're doing? Um, to sift through that continuous recording. Because if you consider a modern sound meter, the options it offers, you could do event sound, where you just start recording alongside an exceedance trigger. Even there, options exist. If you consider the dog bark example, um, a dog barking is likely considered noise at any time of day, but at night it's really annoying. Um, some meters just allow recordings based on external amplitude, and other meters may dynamic trigger, which can be based on the changing background level to pick up on quieter noises that are annoyances, but happer, happen when the space is quieter later. And then some sound meters also allow ground audio recordings uh, at set intervals. It's a great way to sense what's happening over the course of your measurement, and it's used to narrow down anything suspicious that doesn't trigger an exceedance. Uh, and smart dynamic triggering is another great feature, uh, you know, on our meters, uh, the Larson Davis 831C, for example. It can be used to track the background noise level um, where you actually trigger based on the dynamic level from the background plus the defined offset. So what happens is it starts to say, hey, I know the background noise levels dropped at night. Um, I'm 12 dB above the background, L90 or L95 based on the parameter you select. Um, and I'm gonna start recording as well. This is a fantastic way to minimize and start applying some intelligence to how you're recording the sounds for analysis. Um, um, remote access, 
is a great feature of modern sound meters as well. Um, if it's embedded into the system like the 831C, it's fantastic. Think about all the stakeholders in your noise survey, the neighbors in our concert or the construction site foreman or people involved in any stage of environmental study. There's so many people that care about this data and they want to know in real time when there's a noise exceedance. For a modern meter, you can add their emails or cell numbers to a recipient list. And once an event is finished, they all get a notification. Um, you can set various parameters so they could just see a notification, go to, a, you know, a, hear the noise. Um, and most cases, you don't really want to be that hands on with data collection, like going to the date meter itself every day and saving the file off the computer. The meter, along with the modem, um, can be set up to save the files for an external server so you're, you can review them at your leisure. Um, and you know you can have multiple alarm events too. So if you get a catastrophic, you know, red level alarm instead of an alert, you can also be notified. So power planning. So again, one of those things that you may not think about till it comes time to deploy in the field, but starts from the top when you're planning a measurement of how long do you need the meter to run or the system as a whole if you have other USB peripherals added on. Um, so once you're trying to get there, so once you estimate the requirements, um, whether it's just a meter or additional, uh, what's it going to take to be able to run that? You know, is AC power available? Will you have a battery backup? Um, that's certainly ideal to keep a continuous measurement running uh, uninterrupted. Um, and you have little details like extension cords can be easy, easily unplugged, um, even if it's in a fairly secure location. Somebody who comes along and doesn't quite realize what that cord is can unplug it. So that gives you a, kind of that safety net if you are if you have a battery backup to fix that. Um, you've got the solar panel option that you can use out in the field when you're not near a building that may have AC power. So again, solar panel that's keeping that battery built into the system topped off. Um, if you're further out in the field and for whatever reason you can't use solar or have AC power, then you have to rely on batteries. How many batteries will you need to ensure you can run in between accessing the system? It may be in a, you know, you're testing in a more secured site and your access is going to be limited. Uh, so, you know, a system that is great to use uh, that has the solar power integrated uh, can be the NMS of core system. Uh, so, this is a turnkey setup that already integrates uh, the solar panel connection or AC power with the battery built in to have that battery back up and effectively an indefinite runtime uh, as long as the solar panel is set up properly or, or you have AC power. Um, Inadequate solar, you know, right. solar availability. Yep. So depending on where you're at in the world, where you're testing, time of year, um, ensuring that there is just simply enough solar radiance to, to power and charge the system is certainly another planning step in that, in that aspect. Um, for a lighter weight system, uh, using the EPS-042, that uh, uses a series of D-cell batteries. Um, that's a great, easy to deploy, uh, lightweight system that can run the meter for uh, five days up to two weeks, depending on the meter. Uh, so the LXT meter can run a bit longer. It's a little lighter on the energy usage uh, versus the 831C that's going to use a bit more power. But for a short-term measurement, that is a very easy deployment. Um, then you can kick all the way up to just a larger battery system using a 100 amp hour battery. So if you're in a situation where your access is going to be very limited, this might be the step you're using to, to be able to operate for longer periods without being able to revisit the system and, and check on it if solar isn't available or something of that sort. Um, and then finally, what are your meter settings? Um, how, how can you adjust those so there's better runtime? Uh, if you're to basically ensure that you have the power save selection on. Um, in the case of the 831, uh, the USB, you can actually turn power to that USB off. So you're not using or sending power to the USB unnecessarily and hurting your runtime. Um, or if you have a measurement such that you don't really need to use any USB peripherals, whether it's weather or GPS, um, not using any USB peripherals will save you power. Again. The environmental planning, there's a few 
slides here in a row, but um, planning for wind. Um, and again, you know, I, not to pander to everyone, I think everyone knows wind's a problem, but this, the whole point of this thing is just kind of serve as a master reminder. This is great for anyone new, as well as a kind of checklist, click list to make sure. You, so turbulence at mic boundaries, it creates a signal that's not really environmental noise you're trying to measure. Um, it's important to use a windscreen with known performance. Um, a lot of people re reject winds uh, measurements if the wind's over 20 miles an hour. Um, so know when your data can be trusted. So tracking wind and rainfall is great. Uh, Larson Davis offers sensors, one that measures just wind speed and direction. And another one um, is wind speed and direction, temperature, humidity, pressure, rainfall, uh, and more. Um, so those are some great options uh, for that. But having it all in incorporated into a single device is pretty handy. Uh, yeah, and then furthermore for for the environmental planning, so wind is certainly one aspect. Um, but then the S2116 system, um, another aspect to it to guard against rain and other moisture. Um, so we often think of rain as what you're dealing with with moisture, but even humidity can be a challenge too. Um, so any any humidity or moisture in the air that ultimately condenses onto that microphone diaphragm will affect your measurements um, and you may need to essentially reject that portion of the measurement until that moisture is gone off the microphone diaphragm. So the EPS 2116, um, it has basically a rain screen built in, as you can see there in the picture, to help guard against actual rainfall um, getting through the windscreen and further onto the, onto the diaphragm. Um, then furthermore, there's slots where you can add desiccants into the EPS 2116 body to soak up moisture, humidity, condensation, uh, to basically keep the electronics dry and moisture off the diaphragm. And then there's even the preamps like the PRM 2103 that has a heater built in. So it has a uh, temperature and humidity sensor integrated into it, um, and some smarts there. So depending on your humidity con uh, your humidity content and the temperature, it will kick that heater on to essentially keep condensation away from the microphone in the system. Um, so you know all these are important to maintain a, a or to allow you to make a measurement with data that you can use. Uh, just like you might throw out data that has wind over a certain level, um, if it's raining heavily, that piece of data you may also not use because uh, you're effectively measuring at least the sound of the rain, if not moisture getting on the microphone, at which point that data is not particularly useful to you. And most importantly, don't use plastic bags or balloons or something weird like that to cover to cover the uh, microphone. Uh, it, that is affecting what you're measuring it is. firstly. And uh, we had gotten that tip from um, one of Ken Cox from Larson Davis, his presentations, and it's easy to scoff at. But then uh, looking at his presentation, I remember many times when people have done the same thing. I don't know if they think the microphone is magical and a balloon won't affect it, but people sometimes just forget. This is a, maybe maybe a byproduct of having young help that is unfamiliar with the, this equipment, but we've seen it a lot as well. Um, just like a lot of other weather protection cases are available, um, and the power needs can often drive that choice, but um, uh, when the mic, the mic needs attention, the meters also should be protected. You know, protect the electrical connections, avoid electrical shorts, um, anything water, you know. Don't let the case sit in the flood prone areas with snow or near a sprinkler. Um, if water is going to find the meter, it's going to find the meter. Um, and then ambient pressure we'll talk about a little bit later, but basically, uh, you know, the, the barometric reading at the time of measurement is a big driver, you know, in how your meter is going to perform um, at that moment. It may not calibrate the same at, as it would in the lab. And external vibration, this one, uh, generally everything's pretty covered. Just don't mount it near, you know, external vibration sources can either cause uh, a false measurement or an extra noise source. So just try to place the mic and the meter on uh, standard surfaces, if you would. <laughs> I don't know how to put it any better. 
and then um, I'm titling this one stuff that's alive. Uh, uh, you know, the cases have spots for locks and they can be chained to trees and poles and things. But, um, you know, again, this year uh, we had um, some noise monitoring for it was um, a biological study and biology just kept rearing its head. You know, some cows decided to take a shine to some of the meters. Um, probably because they weren't being measured, so they wanted to have their say, I'm not sure. But so they disturbed the early part of the measurement. And then when getting all the uh, meters from the field, a bear had decided to make uh, the area near one of the meters um, part, of, part of her zone. So uh, they were unable to, uh, well, they were attacked. Someone was slightly attacked. So be careful for bear attacks. And uh, so, but you know, all kinds of animals can be around, animals that you wanna measure and animals that you don't. So be careful. And uh, people, and this is a, maybe a word heavy slide, but I think it's important. Yeah, so, you know, people are kind of curious at times, they know yeah. this thing. Um, so how do you ensure that people aren't gonna mess with your system as it's deployed? So, you know, mark the case with useful information identifying what it is, you know, who it belongs to, uh, that sort of situation can be very beneficial. Um, note that the equipment is being monitored. You know, you might use a, a game, a game camera, like you might use one you're trying to track deer if you're a hunter or something of that sort, or uh, you can track the system with a GPS, whether it's a USB-based GPS that's plugged into the meter or with the, or with the cellular modem, uh, you can actually track the GPS with that cellular modem. Um, you might also just make the equipment look inexpensive, like something not really of interest, you know, paint it, distress it, something of that sort. Um, and finally, inform the local authorities, the police or whoever, you know, if you're on a certain property or in a mix of properties, whether it's industrial, let folks know around where you're measuring what it is. Um, well, one of my coworkers a while ago, they had a system that it wasn't marked in any way, shape, or form. A uh, local uh, resident called the police and, well, they called the bomb squad because they thought it was a threat of some sort. So, and honestly, I keep aware. thinking an acoustic, uh, a good acoustic um, paper topic would be surveying a lot of people that either mark or don't mark their product, uh, their, their test article, you know, devices, because there's a lot of strategies and you're going to have outliers curve of what works or don't work so um you know it's unfortunate but a necessary thing to think about is those people um practice using the system this one's so key and this is we'd mentioned before but for memory for power for everything check your cables your calibrators your batteries you're being used batteries are often forgot even a gel cell like a, a nickel metal hydride battery or something if it's cycled or if it's deep cycled, it may not retain the same uh, battery power even when it says it's fully charged. Um, so can you trust your battery? Um, with your meter, get comfortable with the interface. Is there any firmware update required that may you know, address some issues or change the layout of some screens? Make sure you're comfortable using it before you get in the field. And understand what it takes to store the data. Some meters allow you to Different behaviors based on setups, um, but be able to store and recall the data with setup as expected so you can use in the field. Um, use your flash drive or anything external in your cell modems to make sure it works. Um, and set it up and take some sample data. It's a great assurance that everything's been set up properly. And back up your setup onto a PC if available. And the last one we see all the time is synchronize your time. Um, it can be done easily with most meters. Uh, it's just um, really important, you know, as so much depends on time synchronization between a meter and the sound data it's taking. G4 can be a great tool there too with your setups and the ability to manage setups and easily, if you're using multiple meters, you can make one setup, save to G4 and easily add that port that over to multiple meters at the click of a button versus manually going through and setting up each meter at a time. So again, to further ensure that you have good data continuity. So once you've got a setup complete, you can just jump it over as needed. 
And then um, factory cow versus field cow. We don't talk about it much, but in fact, next week's webinar in this summer series is how often to calibrate your sensor. And we're not limiting it to Excels or mics. We're just saying sensor. So that comes here too. Understanding calibration takes many forms. There's a factory calibration and a field calibration. Uh, the factory calibration often tests all parameters, you know, um, from the lowest level of the noise floor to the highest level where it becomes nonlinear. Then the lowest frequency beyond what's measured to the highest frequency to make sure it exceeds. Every part of the A weight filter, for example, every part of a third octave filter shape for each one is tested. The microphone is also tested the same way, a full frequency spectrum. Um, the field calibrator can be calibrated uh, by the factory and get quite a bit of data. That doesn't, field calibration isn't important. Like we mentioned before, the ambient pressure is an important part of how your system can slightly vary from your air conditioned, nicely uh, uh, temperatured lab. So do that field calibration. We actually made a whole webinar on this topic that we'll include in the links that we send later. And include accessories when you're calibrating in the field. Include your cables that you're using, anything in, involved. Um, so now it's the big day. It's time to set up in the field. <laughs> Things to think about as you go out into the fields. Secured your power and your, your data and your uh, memory setup and everything. It's just where are you going to place it? So typically you want to keep it from a number of reflective surfaces, both above and side to side. So you can think of one wavelength from the lowest frequency of interest. So for instance, one meter is a wavelength of approximately 35 hertz. So you can use that as kind of a, a rule of thumb to guide you as far as where you might locate it um, relative to buildings or other surfaces based on the area you're measuring. Um, you know, obviously trying to keep away from public spaces to mitigate interference, uh, you know, if, unless that is of course what you are trying to measure, but if you're trying to measure say a factory, putting the meter in a park where there's gonna be kids playing may or may not be best choice. Um, but again, it is circumstantial based on what the measurement is at hand. Um, then as you're setting it up, if you're able to put it in location where there's fences or other barriers, uh, that you can ultimately use to dissuade people from coming over and visiting it or, or vandalizing the system or whatever it may be. Um, certainly make some educated choices there as far as placement. Again, as long as it is meeting the needs of what your measurement calls for. Um, you know, be aware of things that are overhead, like trees, uh, any sort of awning or anything like that, that might extend a long way that can certainly affect your measurement and the data that, that is being collected. Uh, and then you know, just keep in mind of the general kind of rhythm of the area. Um, if you are measuring an industrial site, there's likely going to be some period where there's going to be garbage trucks or some other regular maintenance coming through. Um, how will that affect your measurement? Uh, that's where sound recording can be very useful so you know when that happens and you disregard that particular portion of the data. Um, yeah, getting a feel for exactly what is going on in a given area can be very beneficial to choosing a good location. Exactly. Once you set up shop with your meter and verify that all your assumptions you made on your environmental uh, were happening, what are you trying to measure? How do your surroundings affect your data? Like, let's say we were trying to measure that uh, the yellow star. So consider some of the other things that are marked here and how they uh, how they affect what's happening. So you can kind of see the trash bin sounds. Um, you can kind of see uh, trains that are passing by. Um, and these may be things that you care about. These may not be things that you care about. Um, or police sirens. So it really depends. Let's say you were measuring a factory for this case. Are these the things that you want to measure? The meter is still going to measure unexpected sounds whether you want them to or not. So uh, just be aware of that. Compensate for the field calibration, just like we had said. It's, it's so important to do it. Uh, and people that miss it, uh, are missing out, you know, you can, you can vary a little bit and do another check when you end uh, your measurement. Um, you know, when you collect your, your meter again near the end, do a quick check at the end. Yeah, and then further notes as you're deploying in the field. Um, so even if you may have GPS so, and, and so on to monitor it, cellular, cellular uh, data con connection, so that way you can 
keep an eye on it from the comfort of your office. Be mindful of where it is. Take a photo, record the location um, from the start. Um, just take photos of your final setup so that way if it was tampered with, if somebody did decide to move in, you're not uh, recording GPS and you're none the wiser, um, you can kind of keep tabs on what that system is. Um, and then finally, just other field notes, kind of going back to uh, what we mentioned before, with kind of getting the rhythm of the area, um, going out there and taking notes of what is going on and what the general happenings are. So you can use that to reference as you're crunching through your data after you make your measurement. Um, this is a shiny picture of a Larson Davis meter set up outside of our shiny new building that we're in before it was a shiny new building when it was just a dust heap and some concrete. Um, Troubleshooting, and you know, I can't think of any pretty photo here, but we're near the ending. But uh, check that the data being pushed to cloud is right. Um, check the trends if you can. Uh, a nice feature is some of the modern sound meters are audio streaming, where you can connect to the meter and listen to the current area sound using the streaming option. It's fantastic. And field check if possible. You know, it may be a pain, but um, go out to the field and check on the the monitoring location if it if it lasts. For some time make sure everything looks okay check for any um you know chewed up cables windscreens things where animals or uh you know vandalism may have occurred from some other cause um, or water or something um so the troubleshooting phase is not one to forget in the long run and then in summary really plan for what you can but expect the unexpected um we really should work towards making a comprehensive list. So I'd say feel free to send us your pitfalls that you've learned from. And uh, this would be a fantastic future topic for us to do at, um, you know, an NCAC meeting or a, a ASA or something. So anything you can add, um, we'd love to include it. We think we've, we've definitely seen some weirder ones, but we've hit the highlights that we've seen people encounter. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day.